Let's talk about, um, we talk, last time we talked about respon uh, being responsible, let's talk about our conscience. And what better place to start than uh, gossiping? Gossiping is any time you talk about someone. Um, that's a real simple definition. It's someone who reveals the secrets. It's a scandal monger, someone who causes problems. Uh, the Bible says a lot about it. Um, all throughout Proverbs, it talks about how they separate friends, how you shouldn't hang around with them. In Proverbs 11, 12 through 13, it says, He who despises his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding keeps silent. He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals the matter. And then um, in Matthew 5, 9, it tells us to be peacemakers. In Romans 1, 28 it's, uh, through um, 32, it says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips. Wait, what? Yes, he's just talking about murderers and how they're, you know, these, these evil people. And he says, they are gossips. God's not real keen on gossip. So um, uh, what is a gossip? It's someone who shares another's failings and shameful life details, often for the purpose um, of building themselves up and making others look bad. They've got to always get in their little gossip groups and tell people, you know, nah, 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 their mouths are always going. Gossipers are, are not always self-aware. They're not always aware that, they're, that they gossip. Um, many say that they were just saying or asking for prayer or just wanted to let you know or etc. Uh, they usually criticize everything, everything. Gospers try to get you on their side with sometimes even half truths, things that aren't really didn't really happen, but maybe it makes them sound better. Um, so the film of blank there is on their side. Um, don't listen or join in conversation if somebody's gossiping. I, Either let them know it's wrong and, and, and put an end to it or, or leave or something, but don't don't join in and don't listen. Well, I didn't say anything. I just listened. That's the exact same thing. Don't invest in someone else's offense. So the film link there is offense. It's none of your business, okay? Don't invest in someone else's offense. It's none of your business. Whatever, whether it's true or not, it's none of your business, especially when you only heard one side. Even if they are your best friend or close family, do not take up their um, problem with someone else. Never, ever, ever encourage bad attitudes. I was there, and this person was wrong and did so-and-so. Well, this person was kicked out of, their, out of their apartment. That landlord is just an evil person. You don't know. Stay out of it. There is such a thing as just staying out of it. I know we live in a, in a society where everybody has to feel like they always have to say everything about everything and then post it online and all kinds of stuff. But you don't have to say anything, um, especially if it's not smart to say anything. Is to say anything. So be the voice of reason. Be a, be the voice of reason. Make peace where there is chaos. Go into a chaotic situation and bring peace and closure to it. Gospers dwell on past offenses and cling to attitudes. You know, it's always about what was done. Even if it's long in the past, it's still something that's very real to their minds. Um, they will make problems and issues where there are none, or where there wouldn't have been if they just would have kept their mouth shut. Um, they frequently get in fights. Why am I saying this? With what attitude am I saying this? What's the underlying attitude? Think about things before you say them. Think about it. Um, is this something that I should be saying? So that takes us, obviously, to the next logical place rebuking someone. How do you rebuke another Christian? Um, obviously with love, but what does that look like? So Matthew 7, 1 through 6 talks about um, not being a critical person. So you don't want to just, uh, you don't want to approach somebody about something if it's not necessary. And if you do approach someone, you want to make sure that they are someone who will accept the advice. You don't want to say something to someone that you know is not going to accept what you're saying, especially if you say it in a way that's not smart. Um, saying it in a way trying to irritate them, for instance. Well, I wasn't trying to irritate them. Okay, so would you be okay with them talking to you like that? 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13. A lot of this is just be nice. For what for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? So um, <clears throat> in chapter 13, 4 through 8a, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. 
Love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecoming, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, it does not take into account of wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Remember, this. he's talking about how, pe how people in the church, he's not talking about love in the sense of marriage, he's talking about love in the sense of people in the church having good relationships with each other. Love never fails. Remember that. Remember these things. These are very, very important to remember these things. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 18. Um, verses 7 through 8. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the body. They're just like a dainty morsel, a, a yummy, a yummy cookie. Oh, they just, they just, ah, ah, ah. but they're, they're going to make you sick, and they don't actually fill you up. Um, 21, 23 says, he who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. Um, so first off, uh, restore, uh, rebuking somebody, that whole idea behind it, it's not a harsh word spoken in fury to blow off steam. I'm mad at you, so I am rebuking you. No, it's also not spoken out of hate. Arrgh, you're wrong. My whole motivation has to be restoring people. My whole motivation for saying anything has to be to restore someone. If your neighbor sins, go to him. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about him. Go to them. Um, what we do is we see that our neighbor sins, so then we go and tell the pastor, or we go and tell our friends. And Brethren, if any one is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Oof. If your neighbor sins, go to him. In Matthew 18, 15, it talks about that. Um, if your neighbor sins, okay, with love. You have to, uh, you have to talk to them with love. Anything you say has to be done for their benefit. And it has to be said in a way that they will receive. If you are friends and speak in a friendly way, it will be easier for them to listen. Don't say things in such a way where you're trying to make to, to, to irritate them. Um, don't go to others to talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one of the phone the blanks. If your neighbor sins, the phone the blank is sins. Um, don't go to others to talk about it. Go straight to them, nobody else. Don't even let others know that there was an issue. If you don't hurt for them, you don't have the right heart. If you don't hurt for them, you don't have the right heart. I, I, I really feel like that's a very important part. If you're not hurting for them, you don't have the right heart. You're not doing it with the right motivation. Well, I'm just tired of dealing with them. Pray first to ensure you have the right attitude. Don't approach someone if it has already been dealt with. If it's in the past, let it go. A lot of issues don't even need to be addressed anyways. Don't approach someone if it's not in your authority. For instance, if someone is outside the church, don't go and use Bible as a, don't go and use the Bible as a weapon. If it's someone else's child, don't go and nag that person's child. I once saw one girl come to church and she wore this dress and she looked so pretty and she was so excited about her dress and someone instantly nit nitpicked her. She didn't wear it right. She it, it didn't fit her. It's like are you being serious? You cannot change everyone else or the circumstances, only yourself. So the final blank there is change. Actively pursue peace. You need it, it depends on you. You have to actively go and try and resolve the issues. Christian, and any time that you rebuke someone, it has to be with the intention of bringing peace. Christians must bring restoration, healing, and direction in situations. These are all very important. Abstain from stupid conversations, things that have nothing to do with anything or that won't help anybody. Don't argue about stupid crap. Just let it go. If someone must lose, let it be you. Take the loss and move on. So that brings us to conflict resolution. 
really there's a lot in the Bible that could be said about this. Let's read a few of the passages that I've written down. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called uh, sons of God. The, I'm sorry, uh, yes, sons of God. And then verses 23 through 24. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Um, you cannot say that you love God if you do not love your brother. Um, for how can you love God who you have not seen when you don't love your brother who you have seen? Chapter 18, uh, verses 23 and on through there. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven must be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And, he, and long story short, he forgives this, this servant, but then that servant doesn't go in and forgive someone else. And so he ends up getting punished um, all the more so. Acts 24, 16. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men. Um, really just important stuff that you learn, learn to have a clear conscience, and you learn to um, help other people, and you just learn to not make your life all about you. Uh, Romans 12, 9-14 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, and bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Don't beat them over the head because they're weeping. Rejoice with them, and then weep with them if they're weeping. Um, really just good stuff there. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14, 1 Peter 3, 17. I will read the one in 1 Peter. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. So let's talk about conflict resolution. Okay. Um, things that seem small to you are big to others and vice versa. You can't say, oh, it's not a big deal to me, but is it a big deal to them? Put other people first. Um, so the film the blank there. Um, to others. Only go to the person you are in conflict with. Never go to anyone else. If the pastor absolutely needs to get involved, get him involved. If you're trying to rebuke someone, and the Bible makes this absolutely clear uh, in Matthew 18, if you're trying to rebuke someone and uh, uh, they won't listen, you take someone else with you, they still won't listen, then you take it to the pastor, the, the leaders of the church, and then they handle it from there. And um, make sure that it's actually something that needs to be addressed. Sometimes it's things that we just don't like. Um, so you always must forgive even if you were wronged. Um, so the fill in the blank there, forgive. You always must forgive. And just a little side note there, um, it's hard to forgive if you won't forget. You have to move past it. Um, however, with that being said, so okay, don't harbor it in your memory. But here's the thing. If someone molested your child, you should not forget in the sense that you would trust them alone again, but you would still have to forgive that person and, and forget it in the sense of not harbor it in your memory. Does that kind of make sense? I, I kind of hope it does. Um, sin does not justify sin. If you reacted poorly, you are also at fault. But they did what was wrong, yes, and you responded wrong. Um, okay. um, when you are trying to resolve a conflict, list both what you think you did wrong and what they think you did wrong. Actually, think about this, okay? Apologize for the underlying attitude which caused the action and ask for forgiveness. And when you're apologizing, so the fill in the blank there, underlying attitude which caused the action. So when you're apologizing, don't qualify your sin. It, I'm sorry if I, no. I was wrong, but no. Allow your pride to die. Just nip it in the bud and apologize. The pride that gets you into conflict keeps you there most often. Don't expect them to be reasonable, but be reasonable yourself. Well, I tried to apologize, and they just, you just, I just can't talk to them. <laughs> you, as much as it depends on you, you do what is right. Um, so 
there that fills takes up the fill in the blanks on that. Just a few more things. If someone must be wronged, let it be you. Take the loss for the sake of God's kingdom. If someone must be humiliated, let it be you. You have no idea how many things Pastor has done that he really lost out on for the sake of other people. And he does it, and Christ did it, and so you should do. Doing things out of love removes any excuse for personal offense. Because if I if I love you, and I'm doing something for you, even if you wrong me, it, I don't have a right to harbor the resentment because I'm doing it out of love. It removes my reason for an excuse. I'm sorry, it, it removes my excuse for uh, to take offense at it. So how do you have a clear conscience? First off, don't ignore those who irritate you. If you watch uh, televangelists, they'll, they'll say this all the time. Well, you just got to get away from people who drain on you, and, and, and you just got to get away from them. And That's a load of hogwash. Avoiding people tells you, teaches you to avoid people. That's all it does. It doesn't ever tell you how to grow from the situation, how to move on. Proverbs 6, 20-23 says... My son, observe the commandment of your father, and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Absolutely. Don't ignore those who irritate you. These little reproofs of life, these um, things that get on your irritation, they have a way of just... Helping us to grow. And don't don't get concerned that there's so much information in these lessons. Pause it. Think about what's being said. Rewind it. So on and so forth. Proverbs 10.12 um, says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love co covers over the transgression. It just covers over. 15.28 The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Thinks about it. But the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Just whatever's on the mind comes out. So this is how you how you get a clear conscience. First off, list those offended. Think about yourself, okay? Analyze yourself. How did you handle it? And others' attitude towards you. Think about the situation, okay? Next, list offenses that you did, not that they did, but that you did from greatest to smallest. Discover your root attitude, okay? Then decide the wording. So with the fill in the blank there, List offenses from greatest to smallest. Discover your root, root attitude and then decide wording. Okay? God has convicted me of how wrong I've been in my... What did you... Whatever you did. Will you forgive me? God has convicted me in my attitude of how I've just been real prideful. I thought that I didn't need anybody else and that I had all the answers and I've just kind of realized about how wrong and because of how prideful I've been it caused me to be very short-tempered to you it caused me to be just real angry and, and, and defensive and because of that I, I said things that were just not right and I shouldn't have please forgive me will, or will you forgive me see when you ask them it, it includes them in rather than just throwing stuff at them but when you are apologizing decide, first off decide the time are they busy are they alone? You don't want to do this as a public thing. This is a one-on-one -on -one thing. How is their attitude? Have you given them time to cool off? Sometimes people need space to calm down and relax, but but don't do it too quickly. I mean, too, too, don't wait too long either. The longer you wait, the more likely you are to not do it. Um, don't take scripture out of context um, for a lot of this. I know it says, drop your offering and go now. The point being, don't put it off, not don't wait till an opportune time. <sighs> You want to do things in such a way where it actually helps mend relationships and helps um, establish something that was broken. Um, decide method. The, the phone in the blank there, method. Uh, sometimes a personal visit, sometimes a call. No texting. Never text somebody apology. Never send them a letter or an email. You either call them or you go face to face. And do not leave a voice message with the apology. Um, don't go into sensual detail. Just keep things, you don't have to talk about your lusts and things that nobody needs to know. Start with the greatest offense. Don't go to others or apologize in front of others. It needs to be sincere and it needs to be private and it needs to be without gossip. Nobody needs to be involved except for those who are involved. 
Their response is not your concern. Now, what I mean by this, you say it in the best way you can, but sometimes they're not going to accept it, and you have to be okay with that. Be gracious. You being sorry doesn't is not conditional on them being able to accept your apology. You are sorry for what you did, and you are trying to make it right. And if they won't accept that, okay, but do your best to mend it. Apologize because you were wrong, not so that you will feel better. Okay, You apologize because you were wrong. You don't apologize so that you'll feel better, and you don't apologize so they can accept you back. Even if you never get anything out of your apology, you still apologize. It's your responsibility to go to someone who's upset with you, even if you didn't do anything wrong. Don't say, they just have to get over it. You try and help them to get over it, and if you fell, well, at least you tried to do what was right. Be a person of character, not just because people are watching, but behind closed doors, too. A genuinely a genuine apology a genuine apology is marked by the desire to heal the other a person when you are genuinely sorry you want them to profit if you get offended when someone rejects your apology you probably weren't sorry in the first place most apologies are rejected because of the way they were said or what was said some are rejected because of past history show that you are sorry after you apologize. Don't just say, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they've said that before. Make it where it's evident that you are sorry. So um, don't delay an apology, but wait to witness. Don't, um, don't try and witness at the same time. Give it time. You will usually know when you are doing something wrong. The fill in the blank there is wrong. Conviction will come. The Holy Spirit will, will convict you or somebody will say something. Bite the bull and make it right. Don't don't wait and just play it off and pretend like nothing happened. Um, unless it's something that would be more awkward for them to bring it back up. Sometimes it's better if you just test the waters and they just get over it on their own. You just have to really be sensitive to them and what's better for them. Um, not what you think is better for them, but what is actually better for them. I don't avoid the problem, even if it seems like the person is not offended, but you know what you did was wrong, apologize. It will change how they see you, and it will also change how they act too. Um, not just not, not towards you necessarily, but towards other people. Um, apologize for masked attitudes. I have been struggling with an attitude problem towards you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Let me come back to that. Okay. Let me just stay on course. Okay. I'm staying on course. Okay. Apologize for masked attitudes. I, you know, I, I, I have an attitude problem, and it's not your fault. It's my fault, and I, I've just been struggling with this. Never ever under any circumstance apologize for sins, especially to the opposite sex, that have to do with sinful habits. You know what I'm saying? If you're a woman, you should not be confessing about lust. To the guy, just no. Bad idea. Um, don't say an apology that is going to cause a conflict. For instance, I really don't like you, and I'm sorry. You're trying to heal them, okay? Apologies are to resolve conflict. I know a lot of people make apologies about you. It's all about you. It's a burden, and, and help, apologizing and forgiving, it helps you to just let go. Yes, absolutely, it does help. But the main point is not to let go. The main point is to seek restoration and to seek healing. Um, expect from your kids what you expect from you. Just a little side note here. Um, don't expect other people to do more or better than you do. That's just not really rooted in reality. Um, so what, what, are the, what are the benefits of a clear conscience? Well, there, there's many. First off, it gives you boldness to witness. You, you know you don't have this bad conscience weighing you down. So you, you know... It, it's good. It's, it's all good. Freedom to resolve conflicts. You feel co confident. You are alert for wise decisions. When, when problems arise in your life, you, you're more, um, because you're not distracted, you're able to make better decisions. Um, power to overcome temptation. Um, God will give you um, more grace and more uh, focus and stuff. So you have uh, power to overcome temptations more. Obviously, once again, you will still have struggles. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say that you're turning into Superman or something. Um, you have the ability to build genuine friendships. 
Um, there's just so much, and, and a lot of these things you won't really understand until you start trying to get a clear conscience, and then you'll start seeing how it applies, and you'll be like, oh, oh. So just keep these things in mind. If you don't understand exactly what I'm saying, you know what, don't worry about it. Just seek to seek to, to do those things I was talking about, apologize and those kinds of things, and it'll just kind of work itself out. Here's the thing, though. Emotions are temporary, and the fill in the blank there is temporary. They come and go. Um, sometimes people say, uh, you know, my conscience is my guide. Well, sometimes our conscience is wrong. And sometimes um, we fool ourselves into saying that something's okay. We can't be led by emotions. We have to be led by reality. And uh, just keep that in mind with things like this. I don't want to go too much into that, but you kind of get what I'm saying. So uh, accountability. Um, this is a great way to maintain a clear conscience. Um, pick one or two wise people of the same sex to help you and answer to. People who will be there. They will regularly stay in touch as a buffer between you and a mistake. Maybe with finances, maybe with other things. Um, there's actually um, anti-pornography software that you can get for your, your computer, for your phone, where it will email them if you go to a site. It will block, it, block the site and email the person. Um, even questionable content. Just a great ways to uh, to stay in the clear. Um, starting conflicts, the word the word they're missing is conflicts. Starting conflicts with opposing authority brings curses and destruction. You you don't want to be the kind of person who's constantly opposing God, who's constantly opposing God's servants, who's constantly opposing the government. You, you don't want to start having power struggles with authority. God doesn't really like that. He makes it absolutely clear throughout his his word. Um, I mean, oof. you read in number 16 where they tried to oppose Moses and God just kind of brought a lot of destruction there. You read about all throughout, really the, all throughout the Bible. Uh, Romans 13 where it talks about getting along uh, with, um, the, with government and stuff and not, um, well, let's just say getting along with government and leave it, with, leave it at that. Hebrews 13, 17, which talks about... Um, submitting to the authority in the church it'll bring curses on your household and your spiritual life you, god will god will withdraw himself from you it will feel like you've run out of luck things just won't go well um and uh, all those things just a, a, one more note about conscience never mock the holy spirit um, don't take god's grace for granted um by mocking the holy spirit um if you read in matthew 12 30 through 32 it clearly says that uh that Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So just keep that in mind. So here's just something to look at. Um, it should be in your sheets for this lesson. This is called the guilt balance. So people always seek to justify themselves, make themselves feel better for the sake of comfort and pride. And that way they don't feel uncomfortable and you know it doesn't hurt so bad. As a result, both the mind and the emotions... Um, let me move this out of the way. Will affirm or will uh, agree... Um, will affirm a bad response, which at first feels easier, but actually weighs you down in conflict. Um, so here we have the balance. Feel, uh, here's guilt and here's blame. Feelings of guilt for his attitudes or actions toward you, but blame toward you for the things you have done to him. So when you apologize with no blame to justify and balance past wrongs, the, their guilt intensifies. And Romans 12 talks about it as putting coal, uh, hot burning coals on their head. If you persist in conflict even after an apology, the root offense will be masked by years of smaller but seemingly more important issues, seemingly more important things. So basically what I mean by that is you have this conflict with somebody, but it's left unresolved. Um, and you won't be you won't resolve the issue, you just kind of leave it. And so then smaller things will happen throughout the years, and both of you will get this kind of scar on you. And you'll do a little thing that will be perceived as an attack by the other person, even if you didn't mean it to. Sometimes you will mean it to, though. And so all these little things, little squabbles, will intensify and intensify, and there's just nothing but bad blood. And it will seem at the time like that's what you're really upset about, but the truth is what you're really upset about happened years ago. You see it happen all the time in marriage, where a husband and wife will be at each other's thro throats, and they'll, they won't even know why. They won't, it won't be a part of their mind. They'll just remember that they're irritated with the person. So here's the problem with all this, though, is you become whoever you resent. 
the reason for that is whatever we aim for is whatever we hit. So here's us over here, this this guy right here. And we can either focus on, on God or we can focus on the person we don't like. If we focus on the person we don't like, we build contempt, we react to offenses, we concentrate, we sting, strengthen our wrong emotional focus by continually reviewing offense, thinking about what they did wrong over and over again, thinking about them, getting more and more irritated, we concentrate, and conformity. We develop similar basic attitudes and attempt to not act the same. So even though we may not be doing the same action, we have the same attitude. But here's how we should have our focus. Conversion, born again, we, we focus on God. Concentration, strengthening emotional focus toward God by comparing his actions and attitudes with our actions and attitudes. That other person isn't a part of the focus. You are focusing on God and then comparing yourself to God, not others. Uh, 2 Corinthians, um, ooh, actually, I'm not sure where this is found. Oof, I hate it when I have a brain fart, but it says when you compare yourself by yourself, you're not wise. Uh, conformity, concentrating on Christ and his word allows you his spirit. Um, his word allows his spirit to produce basic changes. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. And then Mark 12.30 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. To establish our concentration and conformity to Christ, which enables a second. Um, let me kind of clarify what I mean there. When we love God, that that that's this, okay? We love God. It establishes our concentration and conformity to Christ. And in so doing that, it causes us to be able to love our neighbor, which enables us the second commandment. Um, when we react, we begin measuring ourselves by their actions. Well, I, what I did was better. What they did was worse. This produces pride in us. I'm better than them. I don't need to apologize. I didn't do anything wrong. It causes selfishness. It's all about me. And it causes bitterness. I've been hurt. Others then see us in, in us the same thing we condemn the, the other one for. Well, they're just being selfish. Yeah, you're kind of being selfish too. So then we have this you know, uh, problem where we're just going around in circles doing the exact same things. Um, and 2 Corinthians 10, 12 was the measuring yourself by yourself um, passage that I was talking about. So moral of the story here, I know this was a lot to kind of take in. You become who you resent. What you aim for is what you hit. It's like when you're nailing, when you're when you're hammering a nail, if you look at the nail, you're going to hit it. If you look at your thumb, you're going to hit it. And uh, so you really have to make sure that you are trying to grow, not trying to be right. So here's... Um, how you it's just an example here's this guy okay i'll never be like my father here he, we see him comparing and here's his father now there's two sides here okay your root attitude and your visible action so his father was a drunk he neglected him he was unfaithful to his mother and he just absolutely hated him but here's the thing those actions were based off of these attitudes, bitterness, selfishness, pride, self-centeredness. So now the son is doing the exact same thing. He's bitter towards the dad. He's being selfish, just like the father was being selfish by, by neglecting the son. Now he's being selfish by, see what I mean? Uh, then you got pride, I'm better, self-centeredness, it's all about me. So the root attitude is the same, even though the visible action is different. So this, this other person says, hey, you're just like your father. Sometimes you can't see your problem because you're too close to it. It's like if I put something in front of my eyes, well, I can't see because it's, I'm just too close to it. Sometimes you can't see your problem because you're too close to it. You're the problem. And if you go, you're going to have problems in, in relationship after relationship. Find friends who will tell you the truth, not tickle your ear. You don't want people who just tell you what you want to hear. You want people who actually tell you what is true. What you see in others, now get this, what you see in others is usually in you. Oh, they're just, you know, whatever. Be careful. It's easiest to see what's in somebody, what's in us when we're, when we're judging somebody else.
In fact, that's one of the key ways that I know that I've got a problem with something. If I see something in somebody else and I think, ooh, that's bad, then I think, ooh, wait, hold on. I was able to pay attention to that really quick. Why? So um, that takes us to this correct reactions. Um, somebody does wrong to you, you you just do what's right even though they keep doing what's wrong. And eventually, it, when you continue to do what's right, it strengthen, strengthens the qualities in you, makes you a better person, which then brings healing to offender. Okay, so both of you are winning. They tell others, which give you opportunity to witness. Now you have a bigger audience. Those people's achievements then brings joy to you because you are at the root of all this. Now let's let's look how it typically goes. Um, somebody wrongs you, you wrong them back, and now there's a wall. Barrier to further communication. They report to their friends. His friends now resent you. Now ba uh, new barriers are formed between lots of people. Yes, this is unfair. But Christianity is not about fairness. It's about rightness. It's not fair that God should be should be born as a human and die for us. That's just not fair, but it happened anyways. You cannot expect the world to act like Christ, much less the church who is filled with people like you. They're just like you. If you have a struggle, why don't you think they would? Pastor once talked about this, and he said, we expect Jesus to come, people to come to us acting like Jesus, and then we'll lead them to Jesus. But if they already knew Jesus, then they wouldn't need us to lead them to Jesus. Um, so we must give grace and mercy to ourselves and others. In light of this, apologizing becomes even more important. It's absolutely important. Uh, learn to get along with those who irritate you, parents, authority, spouses, acquaintances, because you can always grow. You see that I saw this happen with uh, President Obama. People got really bent out of shape and refused to grow. So they, they right there psh, ha had a group of people who they, could, who they could not be around. I don't remember Jesus doing that. And now the same thing has happened with President Trump, where, you know, just causing a division line, where now there's people who, it, it's like a us versus them again. And as Christians, we can't get sucked into this nonsense. So here's, here's social media, okay? You post something about how you don't like President Trump, whatever. So then this person comments about basically calling you an idiot or whatever. So here's this person, uh, you know, you're going back, uh, you're going back and forth, and now there's a wall between you because of politics, something so stupid and 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 and, and short-sighted. And here is you, maybe, um, maybe they said something about a politician that you like, and so then you just you let it go and you just forgive them. And you know, it's not a, it's not about you, it's about politics. See, a lot of times there we have proxy wars with people, where things that. It's not even about us anyways, but we take personal offense. Don't don't talk about them like that. And it's like, just, just let it go. The energizing power needed to live in the Christian life is called grace. God gives a certain amount of grace to everyone, but the proud resist the grace they get. They want to live their own, their own way, and so they lose God's power. How do they get more? Well, like James 4, 6 says, by, um, by turning from sin, turning to God, and resisting Satan. Whenever we are humbled, we receive at that moment an added measure of God's grace. So here's us being humbled by somebody, and here's us extending grace to someone else because God has given us grace. So every person we heal brings a new door into their lives. So those we offend become closed doors to opportunities for us and for God's kingdom. Everything we do doesn't just affect us, it also affects God's kingdom. So that takes us to the idea, how do I forgive someone? How do I forgive someone? Well, let's let's look at this. First off, prayer is a priority. Prayer, 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 prayer. You gotta get you gotta get your mind clear. And here's the thing, when we pray, a lot of times God won't change the situation, he'll change us. And that's absolutely essential for forgiving someone. Um pray for grace, pray for wisdom, pray pray to help God help me forgive. Step back from the problem briefly. Don't don't leave it. You, you need to address it. But just step back for a second. Look at it. Try to look at it objectively. Uh, pray for their well-being. Instead of gossiping about them, talking bad about them, stop talking about them. And instead, pray for their well-being. Lord, I pray that you bless them. I pray that you would um, just help them to heal and to grow. See what I mean? Now, you're, now your perspective is going to change. And keep doing this. Okay, worship God. Just get alone and pray and read read the Bible and listen to worship music. Just get just get alone and get away from it for a little bit and just worship God, and your your attitude will change. There's a story in First Samuel where King David has men and his city was destroyed. All of, all of his things were taken. His, their their families were taken captive, 
and everybody was so upset they wanted to kill King David. But instead, he goes to the Lord, and he just prays and says that he strengthened himself in the Lord. So just get alone and worship God. Stop justifying your attitude. But they did this. As long as you justify your attitude and think about what they did wrong, you'll never be able to forgive them. You've got to just stop thinking about it and let it go. Don't separate yourself. Sometimes we feel alone because we are alone. We sit in our house all day thinking about how everybody else is wrong. Doesn't We can't honestly expect to grow like that. Combat thoughts with scripture. When something comes into your head, decide what to think about. That's not true. This thing that I'm thinking, it's not true. And I refuse to let it have appear. Instead of thinking about that, think about something else. The Bible tells us to think about things that are good and honorable. Um, if there's something that keeps attacking you about how they don't deserve forgiveness, start memorizing scripture that talks about forgiving. If you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. We forgive because we have been forgiven. Things like that. You, you go over and over and over again. And eventually you see, any time that somebody wrongs you, it's between them and God, not between them and you. You have no right to harbor that grudge. And I know that's hard because there's a lot of things that people do in this world that's really bad. Really, really bad. They go behind us and they say things that are not true. They kill people. They they steal from people. They're just not good. There's evil everywhere. But it's between them and God in the end. So think about blessings. Think about the blessings you've received. Think about um, blessings you could do for them. Uh, think about the positive aspects of their character. Well, what if in the, in the case of, hey, this person molested somebody? That's going to be a little bit difficult. Maybe you won't be able to do that one. Just fo do the things that you can do. Is it based on reality, or did your mind run wild? Sometimes we see the worst in people. Um, don't only look at the bad. See others' pain and see their point of view. Why did they do what they did? What were they thinking? Try and put yourselves in their shoes. Do it quickly. Don't postpone fixing your attitude. The longer you leave the at bad attitude just running wild in your mind, the harder it will be. It takes a while, a very long while, to forgive people. Don't expect immediate result resolution, especially when it took you years to get in this place. Strong sin doesn't just appear in our lives. It's a process. Okay, remember that. So how to correct someone? First off, check your own attitude. Second off, do it alone. Third off, don't delay it for months. Wait about three days and really think about it and pray about it. Is it a molehill? Is it something that's small that you're making into a big deal? You know, like, um, oh, well, she, you know, wore pants in church or he wore a hat in church. Just let it go. I mean, honestly, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Make sure it's something worth mentioning. Make sure it's your responsibility. For instance, you don't reprimand your father. You don't reprimand your mother. You don't do that. Be clear and concise. Don't drag this thing out. Be very specific and then leave room for the Holy Spirit. You know, it's just us. I saw that you'd been looking on por at porn on your computer. And I think that you need to stop and I think that you need to get help. And I think you need to be realistic about how big of a problem this is. That's it. You don't have to say anymore. You don't have to go on and on and on and on. It's like a 10 second thing. Stay on target. Mention what one thing you did, uh, they did, and why it was wrong. If they need it, sometimes people just know what's wrong. You don't want to. People know that looking at pornography is wrong. Well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people know that looking at pornography. Well, sometimes people know that looking at pornography is wrong. You know, and if they don't, you know, then you can enter into dialogue talking about what the Bible says. So stay on target. Don't just go wild nitpicking them about this and that and the other thing. What is the problem? Because if you talk and say, hey, you're doing this, the, the, the knee-jerk reaction that they're going to have is to defend themselves. So you can't, excuse me, you can't be, be surprised when they do defend themselves. People respond better when you know them. If you really, um, if you're going to people that you don't know, you're probably not going to get a good reaction. So here's how not to correct someone. Do not invent rules for the church. Uh, we're a fragrance-free church, so you need to not have fragrances on. Okay. No hats in church. Um, we don't have that rule here. Um, the KJV is the only Bible. Um, no, once again, not a rule. Um, so just one last note. One of the quickest ways to get a teenager to distance themselves from you is to nitpick. Going on and on. You don't like their hair. You don't like their clothes. You don't like their music. You don't like their taste in movies. You don't... They, they understand you don't like them. 
let let it go. Um, especially the older you get, the harder it is to adapt to the new generation. It's always harder to do that. That's just a fact of life. Notice the positive. That's that's not how. Like I said about the about the girl wearing the dress. That's not how you wear a dress. Uh, you know, how about you say, "Wow, you look really nice in a dress." I mean, just be nice. Uh, they aren't going to do things the way you want. That's just a fact of life, and they will need to make their own choices. You can't make their choices for them. You guide and direct, but more so than any of those things, pray and be a good example and be there for them. Because here's the thing. What you do in your teenage years is not the end of the battle. It's not. There, there are other things. You know, We make mistakes when we're teenagers. It's what we do. And then we grow up and we learn from our mistakes and then we regret them and we move on. Right? Um, so more so than all those things, pray. And remember that the things that I'm talking about apply to a lot of different areas in life, not just specifically what I'm talking about. They will resent you for protecting them from harm. Only give wisdom at key times or if asked. If you always have two cents, you won't have any sense to give. Um, so if you have any questions, please ask them below. Um, other than that, the next lesson is lifestyle, the Christian lifestyle.